Hello and thank you for checking out today's video. We just want to remind you that we're still releasing new episodes of our podcast, Into the Killing. You can find it on Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and anywhere you find great podcasts. We also recently launched another channel called Paranormally Listed, where we talk about things like UFO encounters, sightings of monsters, ghosts and hauntings, and other unexplained phenomenon. There's a link to Paranormally Listed in the description box, and we'll also have a link at the end of this video. Before today's video, we want to bring you a short message from our wonderful sponsor, Hero Wars. You know what drives me nuts while watching YouTube videos? Seeing through the ads. But now, I found something fun to do when they roll, and that's play my new favorite RPG, Hero Wars. Right now, I'm leveling up Rufus, who I really wish was my dog. But he's just one of the amazing characters in Hero Wars. He uses his shield to crush people. I've unlocked a dozen other characters, but my favorite has to be the gothic looking Phobos. He looks like a character straight out of Edgar Allan Poe's Nightmares. Another awesome character is Galdahad, who you start off the game with. Then there's King Mao, who controls a dragon. Mojo, who has the Totem of Wrath. And then there's Ginger, you don't want to be in the way of her storm. You can boost all the character stats with skins. To get rewards like awesome equipment, coins, and soul stones to make your heroes the best they can be, just complete missions. You'll also get more experience points and improve their skills. Did I mention game modes? Hero Wars has six different ones. Since I'm on level 30, no big deal. I have access to guild mode so I can battle other guilds, but my favorite thing to do is fight the Titans. You should get Hero Wars today because you'll get five awesome heroes. Who's the fifth hero? You'll have to find out after downloading the game. Plus, you'll get 600 emeralds and 30,000 gold coins. Hero Wars is available on mobile and in browser. Download it now. Let's go play. Number 3. Lee Rotatory Lee Gonzalez was born in Fargo, North Dakota in September 1949. She grew up on the outskirts of Rochester, Minnesota. She was the oldest of four children. After high school, she got a bachelor's degree in dietary services from the University of Wisconsin. Then she got her master's degree in food nutrition. In November 1970, when Lee was 21, she married a man named Anthony Rodatori. Shortly afterward, she gave birth to a son named Michael. Lee and Anthony's marriage didn't last and they divorced after seven years. In August 1978, Lee married Jerry Nemke. Lee decided to keep her first husband's last name for professional reasons and because her son had the same last name. Lee and Jerry ended up divorcing the next year. But in December 1981, they remarried. In June 1982, Lee got a job as the food service director at Jenny Edmondson Hospital in Council Bluffs, Iowa. In mid-June, Lee moved into the Best Western Frontier Motor Lodge Motel in Council Bluffs. Her husband, Jerry Nemke, stayed behind in Michigan. He planned on moving their mobile home to the area after she was done her training. Lee's son lived with his father in the Chicago, Illinois area. On June 24, 1982, Lee went out boating with some new friends she made at the hospital. The next morning, Lee did not show up for work. It was her first formal day in her position. Her boss called her room several times but Lee didn't answer the phone. He called the hotel staff and they were able to get into her room. They found 32 year old Lee Rotatori dead on the room's bed. The medical examiner determined she had been stabbed once in the heart. She had also been sexually assaulted. Some items were missing but the police weren't sure the robbery was the motive behind the murder. The first suspect in the case was Lee's husband, Jerry Nemke. It turned out he had a disturbing history. On April 29, 1960, 22 years before Lee's murder, 17-year-old Nemke picked up 16-year-old Marilyn Ray Duncan from her friend's home in Chicago, Illinois. At the time, Nemke was on the lam because he didn't return to a camp for juvenile offenders after a furlough. 
After Nemke picked up Marilyn, he picked up a ball of wine. They parked in a quiet area and walked to a railroad embankment. They sat down and drank some wine. Nemke then tried to seduce Marilyn, but she turned him down. Nemke became angry, so he picked up a brick and struck her several times in the head. He then stripped her and raped her. Once he was done, he left her for dead. Marilyn was found unconscious and taken to the hospital. She never woke up and she died two days later. Since Nemke was the last person seen with Marilyn and his glasses were found near her body, a warrant was issued for his arrest. He was found in a stolen car the day after Marilyn died. He was taken into custody and he confessed to the murder. Nemke went to trial in August 1960. Although he had confessed, when he found out he was facing the death penalty, he pleaded not guilty. The trial lasted three days. The jury deliberated for 41 minutes. They found him guilty and he was sentenced to die in the electric chair. But Nemke caught a break. His lawyer appealed the conviction. After Nemke was arrested, his lawyer, who his mother had hired, was at the police station and he had repeatedly asked to see Nemke. But officers wouldn't let him see his client. During that time, Nemke confessed to the murder. So the Supreme Court of Illinois ruled that his confession was inadmissible and they overturned his conviction. The district attorney didn't believe they had enough evidence to retry the case without his confession so Nemke was free after serving two years in prison. After that, Jerry Nemke cleaned up his life. Then, 20 years later, Nemke's wife was sexually assaulted and murdered in a motel room. The police cleared Nemke as a suspect in Lee's murder because he wasn't even in the state of Iowa when the murder was committed. A major problem with solving Lee's murder was the location. Hotels constantly have people coming and going. Many people who stay there don't live in the area. The motel where Lee was killed was even more problematic because it was located near an interchange. After committing the murder, the killer could have been on the highway within minutes and then possibly never returned to the area. So the case quickly went cold. In 2001, the evidence was sent to the State of Iowa Division of Criminal Investigation Lab. They found some male DNA, but no match to the DNA was found in any of the databases they could access. For another 18 years, the case sat cold. In 2019, the DNA was submitted to Parabon Nano Labs. They found a sixth to eighth cousin of the suspect. This narrowed the suspect list down to several thousand people, which didn't help much. Then, in March 2020, 18-year-old Eric Schubert from Medford, New Jersey, contacted the police in Council Bluffs. Schubert was a college student, but his college was temporarily closed because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Schubert told the police that he was incredibly interested in genealogy and he might be able to help them solve crimes through genetic genealogy. He first became interested in genealogy when he was 10 years old and recovering from pneumonia. The police agreed to let him help. He traced the killer's family tree for nearly two years using genetic genealogy. He finally came to a man named Thomas Oscar Freeman. However, Freeman was dead when Schumann identified him as a suspect. The police got a DNA sample from Freeman's daughter and they confirmed he had killed 32-year-old Lee Rodatori. At the time of the murder, Freeman was 35 years old. He was a trucker who was a bit of a transient. He moved around frequently and never had a steady job. When Lee was killed, Freeman lived over 500 miles away in West Frankfurt, Illinois. On October 30th, 1982, Freeman's dead body was found under some brush in an isolated rural area 
outside of Cobden, Illinois. Cobden is about 25 miles from his home in West Frankfurt. Freeman had been shot four times in the chest with a 25 caliber gun. A shallow hole was found near his body. It looked like someone had tried to dig a hole to bury the body, but they didn't have the right tools to dig the grave. Instead, they hid his body under some brush. When the body was found, the medical examiner thought that Freeman had been dead for about three months. Freeman's family thought that they last saw him in August 1982. They never reported him missing because he often disappeared for long periods without telling anyone. Freeman's killer has never been arrested. The police are curious if Freeman's murder is somehow connected to Lee's murder other than the fact that he killed her. Freeman was shot to death about two months after Lee was killed. The detective who worked on Lee's case said he does not believe in coincidences. He also said that Lee had connections to Illinois. However, no evidence has ever been found connecting Freeman's murder to Lee's murder other than Freeman being Lee's killer. The Illinois State Police are currently investigating Thomas Freeman's murder. But after nearly 40 years, the police and Council Bluffs consider the murder of Lee Rotatori solved. Number 2. Stacy Falcon Dewey and Jacob Dewey In October 1994, Stacy Falcon Dewey and her three-year-old son, Jacob, lived in an apartment in Ken, Washington. Ken is part of the Seattle-Tacoma-Bellevue metropolitan area. Stacy worked as a cocktail waitress at a restaurant in Ken. Stacy and Jacob's father had split up in 1992. In October 1994, she was dating another man. They had lived together on and off for several months. Just before 3.30 a.m. on October 28, 1994, a newspaper carrier was on Dead End Road near Renton, Washington. Downtown Renton is about seven and a half miles from downtown Kent. In the middle of the road were the dead bodies of a woman and a toddler beside a car. He immediately called the police. The police found the woman's purse in the car and it contained her wallet and her driver's license. They identified the woman as 23-year-old Stacy Falcon Dewey. They soon learned that the boy was her son, 3-year-old Jacob Dewey. They both had been shot to death. Stacy also had a large cut on her head. The police did their best to piece together what had happened. Stacy's wrists had been bound with packing tape. They noted that her socks were muddy, but Jacob's were clean. Next to the car was a grassy patch that had been torn up, so it looked like there had been a struggle. The police surmised that Stacy was in the driver's seat, and she managed to wiggle free of the tape. She tried to run, but the killer caught her beside the car. He struck her on the head and then forced her back into the driver's seat. Shell casings were found both inside and outside the car. The killer then got into the passenger seat. He probably shot Jacob first while Stacy was holding him. The bullet went through Jacob's little body and entered Stacy's body. The killer then got out of the car, went around to the driver's side, and shot Stacy. He then pulled their bodies out of the car and they attempted to steal the vehicle. But the keys had fallen into the slot between the door and the driver's seat. So he ended up not finding the keys. He ended up fleeing on foot. The police were baffled as to the motive. Nothing appeared to have been stolen and there were no obvious signs of sexual assault on either victim. But later, an oral swab was done on Stacy, and traces of semen were found. So it appeared that the killer had forced Stacy to perform oral sex on him. The police then interviewed Stacy's ex-husband and her current boyfriend. The police asked them to take polygraph exams, and they both agreed. The results of the polygraph exams were inconclusive. 
The two men also didn't have great alibis for the time of the murders. Nevertheless, the police thought that both men were believable when they said they didn't commit the murders. The police then set to work trying to figure out Stacy and Jacob's final hours. Stacy had the night off from work. She dropped off Jacob at a babysitter's apartment and then went to the bar where she worked and she met several friends. She stayed for an hour, then went out to two more clubs. She left at about 1 a.m. At 1.20 a.m., she stopped at a 7-Eleven store to purchase some beef jerky. She picked up Jacob at 1.45 a.m., and the babysitter noticed nothing unusual about Stacy. Then, less than two hours later, Stacy and Jacob were found murdered. The police have no idea why they ended up in Renton or who killed them. Unfortunately, it wasn't long before the case went cold. The police did have one strong person of interest in the case. Before she started dating her current boyfriend, Stacy had dated another man named Scott Holm. But it turned out that he was married, so Stacy ended the relationship. Holm had called Stacy on her cell phone just a few hours before she was killed. Less than two weeks after Stacy and Jacob were murdered, 27-year-old Scott Holm was found dead. He had been stabbed to death. Holm and his identical twin brother had recently started a car detailing business. They had installed subwoofers valued at about $1,000 in the car of Holm's friend, Vincent Field. The police went to Field's apartment and they found traces of blood. Fields told the police he had talked to Holm. He said that Holm had been having an affair with a woman and she had threatened to tell his wife. She was also going to tell the police that he had been trafficking marijuana. So Holm said he had, quote, cleaner clock, unquote. Fields then admitted that he killed Holm, but he said he did it in self-defense. In August 1995, Fields was found not guilty of first-degree murder, but he was convicted of second-degree murder. Initially, the police were not sure what to make of what Fields told them about Holmes' confession. Holmes' brother said that Fields made up everything. He said, if anything, Fields killed Stacy to frame his brother. He also said that his brother was never involved in marijuana trafficking. Fields took a polygraph exam, and he passed. But the police never found any physical evidence to connect Scott home to the double murder, so the case went cold. In July 2001, the police arrested a man for multiple felonies. The man was addicted to methamphetamine. He said he heard a drug dealer bragging about murdering a woman and her son on a dead-end road because she had snitched on him. The police thought he might be talking about Stacy and Jacob. So the evidence from their crime scene was sent to the crime lab. In September, the detective learned that male DNA had been pulled from the oral swab. The DNA was inputted into a database and a match was found. However, the DNA did not belong to the drug dealer. It belonged to a man named Jerome Frank Jones. Jones was born in August 1970. He grew up near Compton, California. In the 1980s, he was a member of the street gang, the Crips. He was arrested several times for robbery, carjacking, and for shooting a man. This was all before he turned 21. In 1993, Jones moved to Washington State. When the investigators learned the results of the DNA test, they were shocked. They had never heard of Jones, let alone had considered him a suspect or a person of interest in the murder of Stacy and Jacob. When the DNA was matched to Jones, he was in prison in California. On March 31, 1994, 30-year-old Gregory Hebden was shot to death in Irvine, California. Hebden was married and a father of two. He was killed on his ninth wedding anniversary. Hebden co-owned a business that did restorations on homes and businesses to
damage by fire and water. Witnesses pick Jones and another man have a photo lineup. Jones was arrested two months after the murder in Seattle, Washington. In November 1998, Jones was convicted of first degree murder. He was sentenced to 56 years in prison. In November 2002, investigators traveled to California to interview Jones in prison. He claimed he didn't know Stacy Falcon Dewey. The police knew he was lying because the semen had been found in her mouth. After the interview, the police decided to examine all their other persons of interest in the case. Through DNA testing and polygraph examinations, they eliminated them all as possible suspects. They also had DNA from under Stacy's fingernails compared to Jones's DNA. Once again, it was a match. The problem for detectives was connecting Stacy to Jones. They didn't know each other, so how did Jones end up in Stacy's car? It turned out that Jones had a friend who lived close to Jacob's babysitter. From his apartment, you could see the area where Stacy usually parked her car. So, the case was pretty much closed in July 2004. But, the district attorney didn't think that the case was strong enough to take to trial. He wanted the crime scene to be reconstructed with a sequence of likely events. But, for unknown reasons, this never happened. The district attorney moved on to other cases. Eventually, the murders of Stacy Falcon Dewey and her son Jacob Dewey, which were basically solved, were forgotten. Then, in 2010, the Red Police Department's cold case unit was disbanded because they had lost funding. During all this time, Stacy and Jacob's family were anxious for answers. But they didn't learn about the DNA match to Jerome Jones until March 2019, when the Seattle Times did a three-part series on the murders. They had not heard from the police or the district attorney's office in years. Three detectives who worked on the case were interviewed for the series. They said they had no idea why Jones was in charge with the murders. After the series was published, Stacy's mother started a letter writing campaign to get the case taken to court. The police reopened the case to look to see if they could find more ways to connect Jones to the murders. In December 2021, they found some semen on Jacob's jacket that belonged to Jerome Jones. In February 2022, over 27 years after the murders of Stacy Falcon Dewey and her three-year-old son, Jacob Dewey, 51-year-old Jerome Jones was charged with two counts of aggravated murder. Jones was supposed to be extradited from California to Washington to stand trial for both murders at the end of February. No trial date has been set. Number 1. Maurice Chivarella In spring 1964, Maurice Chivarella was 9 years old. She lived with her family in Hazleton, Pennsylvania. She was the fourth of five children. Her family referred to her as a little mother. She happily did housework without complaining. She also worked at the family's small grocery store, which was next door to their family's home. Maurice played the organ and she was devoutly religious. She attended Mass every morning and she wanted to be a nun when she grew up. Maurice never walked to school alone because she was afraid of dogs. But March 18th, 1968 was a feast day for one of the nuns at her school. Feast days mark the day when a woman enters the novitiate, which is a period of training and preparation that a Christian novice undergoes to decide if they can dedicate themselves to a religious life. Often, the children bring the nuns something they can have as a treat on their feast day. So on March 18, 1964, Maurice left her school early with two cans of fruit for the nun. It was the first time Maurice walked to school alone. She wanted to drop off the cans of fruit at school and then make it to the church by 8 a.m. for Mass. But tragically, that never happened. 
When Marie didn't come home for lunch, her family became concerned. Her mother called the school to see if she was in the cafeteria. That's when she learned that Maurice never arrived at school that day. Just after 1 p.m. that same day, a man was dumping some ashes in an abandoned mine about three miles from Maurice's home. The mine shaft was where people in the area commonly dumped trash. At the bottom of the shaft, he found the dead body of a little girl. She was quickly identified as Maurice Chivarella. She was fully dressed except for her shoes. Her shoes were found a short distance away. Her wrists and legs had been bound. Stuffed in her mouth was her scarf. She had been raped and strangled to death. The police immediately started a massive investigation. According to a newspaper article printed in the days after the murder, it was the first time a child had been murdered in a sex crime in recent memory. The police said that they always had suspects, but they never made an arrest in the case. There was speculation that the murder was connected to another killing that happened 17 months earlier in Bristol, Pennsylvania. Bristol is about 100 miles south of Hazelden. On October 22, 1962, 9-year-old Carol Ann Daughtry was found raped and strangled to death on the landing of the choir loft in St. Mark's Catholic Church. There are several notable similarities between the two brutal crimes. Both victims were 9-year-old girls who attended Catholic school. They were both raped and strangled and a piece of clothing had been stuffed into their mouths. In Carol's mouth was one of her socks. But it was only speculation that the two cases were connected and the police never found any physical evidence that connected the two murderers. For decades, there was no progress on Maurice's case. In 2007, 43 years after the murder, forensic experts examined the evidence. They found male DNA on Maurice's jacket. They were able to create a DNA profile. The DNA was entered in the state and national databases, but no match was found. In March 2019, the police released composite images developed by Parabon Nanolabs based on the DNA. The images generated no leads. But in 2020, 18-year-old Eric Schubert, the same man who helped find Lee Rotatori's killer, offered to help. The police agreed, and using the DNA, Schubert found a sixth cousin of the killer. For the next two years, Schubert did genetic genealogy to track down the killer's identity. It led him to a man named James Paul Forte. Forte had died in 1980 from natural causes, possibly a heart attack. He was 38 years old when he died. On January 6, 2022, the police had his body exhumed and a sample of his DNA was taken. A month later, they got the results of the DNA testing. Forte's DNA was a match to the DNA found at Maurice's crime scene. The odds of the DNA belonging to someone else is 1 in 487 septillion. That's 487 followed by 24 zeros. The police statement read, to put the numbers in perspective, it is estimated that there have only been 117 billion people who have ever inhabited the earth. In order to find another match to Mr. Forte, you would need to search over 4 million planet Earths. So, who exactly was James Forte? He was born and raised in Hazleton. In October 1959, he enlisted in the army. He was discharged in October 1962. In 1964, when Maurice was killed, he was 22 years old. He lived a few blocks from Maurice and her family. He had no known connections to Maurice or her family. He was not considered a person of interest or a suspect. He had a criminal record, but he was arrested for the first time in 1974, 10 years after Maurice's murder. 
a 23-year-old woman had accused him of sexually assaulting her in her car. Forte pleaded guilty to aggravated assault in September 1973. He was given a year of probation. Forte was arrested four years later for reckless endangerment and harassment, while the records for that crime could not be located. Forte never got married and didn't have any children. When he died, he was working as a manager of a catering company. Maurice's siblings said they never wanted to get revenge or make sure the killer was punished, but they wanted justice. After 58 years, they know the killer's identity and they feel that justice has been served. The police did not say if James Forte is considered a suspect in the murder of Carol Ann Daughtry. What is known is that Forte was discharged from the army a week before her murder. The police have never found any physical evidence that connects the two crimes. If you want to learn more about the murder of Carol Ann Daughtry, we cover her case in our video, Three Creepy Unsolved Church Murders. There is a link to that video in the description box below this video, and we'll have a link at the end of this video. Thank you so much for watching today's video. Don't forget to check out our new channel, Paranormally Listed. There's a link on the screen now.